Nucleic acids store and transmit genetic information. The information is stored as DNA and transmitted as RNA. Now, DNA is a polymer of nucleotides and we can see the nucleotides in the molecule here. Now these nucleotides are connected by a special bond called a phosphodiester bond. And this might seem like a kind of complicated name, but it actually just means something very simple. These two chemical groups here are esters. This is a phosphate. One phosphate, two esters, phosphodiester bond. Now, getting back to the nitrogenous bases, we can see that the nitrogenous bases are attaching the two strands of DNA, and they attach from hydrogen bonds. Now, what you may or may not have noticed is that the strands are actually not parallel. So let me explain. To be considered parallel, we have to have two things lined up next to each other and pointing in the same direction. So DNA, the two strands are lined up next to each other, but they're actually pointing in opposite directions, kind of like these arrows. So here we have parallel arrows, and here we have anti-parallel arrows. So the strands of DNA are actually considered to be anti-parallel to each other. And this has to do with that three prime and five prime distinction that I was talking about on the previous page. You see, the phosphate group always attached at the five prime end always hangs off one end of the DNA strand like we see here and here. And the three prime end with that hydroxyl group is always at the other end of the strand. So in a sense, if we think of, let's say the five prime end is the back of our arrow and the three prime end is the tip, we can see that the strand of DNA, or these strands of DNA rather, are anti-parallel to each other. Now, let's take a moment and talk about the difference between DNA and RNA. I'm going to take myself out of the shot. Now, here we have RNA, and while DNA is double-stranded, RNA is a single strand, though structurally it's very similar. We know that the differences are in the sugar, this is ribose, remember, and DNA uses deoxyribose. We also see again that RNA is a single strand, and DNA is a double strand and the last difference has to do with uracil. You see DNA uses four base pairs, four of the five we mentioned. Those are A, T, C, and G. RNA on the other hand uses A, U, C, and G. In RNA, uracil replaces thymine. So that's one way you can tell DNA and RNA apart. If there's uracil in the molecule, you know it has to be RNA. And if there's thymine, you know it has to be DNA. Now, speaking of these base pairs, there's something that we haven't talked about yet. And that's the specificity of base pairing. Now, I mentioned that these base pairs hold the two strands together, and this is done through hydrogen bonding.
but what we didn't talk about is the specificity of this base pairing. You see, adenine only pairs with thymine, or in the case of RNA, with uracil. And these two molecules form two hydrogen bonds with each other. Just like adenine only pairs with thymine, guanine only pairs with cytosine. But these two form three hydrogen bonds with each other. So which of these base pairs do you think would be harder to pull apart? Well, if you're thinking guanine and cytosine, you're right. That extra hydrogen bond is going to keep them more strongly attached to each other. Now, because certain base pairs only bond with certain other base pairs, or rather, because certain nitrogenous bases pair only with certain other nitrogenous bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, because of this, if we know the code along one strand of DNA, we can figure out what the code on the other complementary strand would be. And that's the word we use to describe this relationship, that the two strands are complementary. Because an A at one location on one strand is going to be a T at the same location on another. So, to give you an example to think about this, let's say that I have a strand of DNA and we're going to read it from the 5 prime end to the 3 prime end and my strand goes A, A, T, C, G. All right, now with this little piece of DNA, we can figure out what the complementary piece is going to be. Now remember, these strands are anti-parallel. So up top, we're going to have the 3 prime position, and then a T, another T, right? Because A and T pair with each other. Then an A, a G, and a C. And that is going to be the 5 prime end. So, because of the specificity of base pairing, with one strand of DNA, we can figure out what the complement will be. Now, one other thing that's worth noting is that with adenine always pairing with thymine or uracil, and with guanine always pairing with cytosine, we always have one purine pairing with one pyrimidine. So here we have purine pairs with pyrimidine, right? Because adenine is a purine, thymine is a pyrimidine. Likewise, guanine's appearing and cytosine's a pyrimidine. So let me ask you then, what percentage of DNA is going to be made of purines? And what percentage is going to be made of pyrimidines? Well, if adenine and thymine always pair together, and guanine and cytosine always pair together, and adenine and guanine are purines, and cytosine and thymine are pyrimidines, then 50% of DNA has to be purines, and the other 50% has to be pyrimidines, because there'll be one of each at each base pair in the molecule. So, thinking about this, if we had a piece of double-stranded DNA and we know that 35% of it, I'm going to take myself out of the shot again so you can read the whole question. So we know that 35% is adenine and 15% is cytosine. 
How much thymine and guanine do we have? Well, again, the percentage of adenine we have should in theory be equal to the percentage of thymine, right? Because those two are always going to pair with each other. So we'd have 35% thymine and same goes for cytosine and guanine. So then we'd have 15% guanine. All right, let's flip the page. 